Hello everyone. So with this, we are entering into part nine of Indian Constitution. Prior to this, we already have covered part one of Indian Constitution that deals with union and its territories. Part two of Indian Constitution that deals with citizenship. Part three that deals with fundamental right. Part four that deals with DPSP. Part four A fundamental duties. Part five the union. Part six the states. Part seven has been repealed. Part eight. that deals with uh, union and its ter- sorry union territories right so that we are not covering part 8 we are not covering part 8 will cover once we have completed this part 9 of indian constitution so all these parts except this part 8 right all other parts part 1 part 2 part 3 up to part 6 has already been covered right so if you have not watched those video you can go to the polity lectures right full length lectures section uh, you can open that playlist and you can watch all those lectures so with that declaration we are entering into part 9 of indian constitution and part 9 as i already told you deals with panchayati raj so uh, and this part 9 had been inserted into indian constitution by 73rd constitutional it's amendment so by 73rd amendment you had this insertion of part 9 of indian constitution and part 9 of indian constitution deals with panchayati raj and that we are going to discuss then you had this next constitutional amendment and that w- that is 74th constitutional amendment and that was passed along with the 73rd itself and similar this 1993 and it added part 9 a into indian constitution part 9 a into right and that deals with urban local government ulbs right that is municipalities at the city level so you have this insertion of pris panchayati raj institution that deals with uh, local self government at the village level right and then urban local government that is municipalities at the city level so part 9a you have part 9b as well part 9b that deals with cooperative societies right so there are three part 9 part 9 part 9a part 9b panchayati raj urban local government urban uh, local bodies right municipalities and then cooperative society societies that is part 9b i hope that clarity you will have so let us discuss that what is going to be scope for this particular video as of uh, as about this panchayati raj whole of the panchayati raj cannot be covered because this is going to be and this chapter is going to be very important very very important for your mains so make sure that whenever you come across any new article either in the hindu or express right you cover regarding this panchayati raj or urban local governments right there is wide scope as far as this particular video is concerned right this particular video is going to set a context that what was actually premise for this 73rd and 74th amendment so from here you can see that there will be factual questions right although the recommendation of Bal- balwant rai mehta committee this gvk committee then ashok mehta committee those recommendation may be useful but this is just going to set a context so in this video as far as scope of this video is concerned right we'll first discuss that why panchayats or municipal bodies are necessary what is their importance what is their significance then we'll discuss the genesis of this panchayati raj right how it has evolved how it has started from ancient time there after medieval medieval section we'll jump right from directly from ancient time we'll jump into the british time how it this uh, uh panchayati raj system has evolved during the britishers time and thereafter we'll directly jump into uh, uh post independence section where we'll see that how many committees had been formed and thereafter uh, this 73rd and 74th amendment we'll discuss right so evolution of panchayati raj system post independence and as i already told you that this chapter is going to be very important as far as your gs2 mains is concerned rather in sa paper as well these kind of topics can be uh ask right there is a possibility that these kind of topics may be asked because this is this chapter is nothing see uh, when constitution uh had been operationalized you have only two layers of government right you had at the center you had this parliament union government and at the state level you have assembly so with the, with this creation of this panchayati raj institution and or urban local bodies what it has done is that after union you have this state and it has added another level of governance right so it has just simply democratized the aspirations of the people and that's why uh possibility of asking the question from this section in the mains or essay is 
increased and that is why I am emphasizing that this chapter is going to be very important as far as your mains is concerned. So, without wasting time let us enter into next slide and let us start this chapter with the declaration and what would be the declaration. So, in this particular chapter you will see heavy usage of strong kind of uh, advanced kind of vocabulary. So, before you start this chapter right. So, what kind of vocabulary that will be used in this chapter. So, in this chapter or whenever you see any kind of editorial on the Panchayati Raj institution you will see these kind of vocabulary that will be generally used that is democratic decentralization deepening the roots of democracy then bureaucratization of development process many institute i have come across that do suggest their students that no 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 just simple you write simple english and you will get numbers the only thing that you need to ensure that your answer should be somewhat different your answer should have innovation but mind you suppose let us see see this exam is all about this comparative advantage that you have to take because ultimately you have this 700 or 800 requirements and out of that 700 at 800 means people do not fight for those 700 or 800 posts right you do have these 80 or 90 IAS posts and you have these 150 or 130 or sometime 200 IPS posts so whole of the fight is concentrated here for these 250 or 300 posts nobody is going to means nobody does care about this nobody prepare uh, or appear in this UPSC exam especially right to become IRTS or IRS I do know means uh, most of the and I am not seeking uh, I am not making any kind of generalization when I am saying that the most of or all the students does fight only for these three there are people who does do work as a IRS right that is also a very noble profession right that is also a grade A job right but most of student I have seen or come across right they do what you have to be right I have to be IAS what you have to be I have to be IPS right so I was talking about this and this exam can be cleared only by this com taking comparative advantage over the other candidates so suppose many as I was saying that uh, this institutes just suggest that you just have to be innovative in your approach right so suppose one student right he is innovative but he is writing just basic english now again i will issue a caveat that i am not discouraging you right so there is one uh, candidate who is innovative in his approach he is writing good concept he is taking good example from current events he is drawing and he is writing innovative answer plus basic english right there is another student right who along with being innovative he is writing these kind of english these kind of terminologies right and these kind of terminologies it is not specific only to the polity right these kind of terminologies you will have in geography as well so every subject does have 250 or 300 vocabulary right so about the panchayati raj you have these words like deepening the roots of democracy or democratic decentralization bureaucratization of development process so similarly you will have sim similar terminologies in geography as well history as well right so every subject does have those 300 or 400 terminologies and if you use those 300 or 400 terminologies if you can remember those right i can guarantee you that you will excel in this exam as far as means i am talking about i am not talking about pre so I was taking example of this comparative advantage so suppose there is one student who has written innovative answer but he has used only basic English there is another student who has written this innovative uh, his approach is innovative he has taken current example as like this student but his English is like of this nature right he has written this advance as an examiner or rather let us say that you are the examiner right so if you are awarding 12 marks out of 20 marks uh, of 20 marks question right if you are awarding 12 marks to this person you will have to be compelled to award 13 marks or at least 12 and half marks right so out of 20 if you start awarding or, or if a candidate start getting one mark additional for his advanced English or right usage of the terminologies for that particular subject you can imagine that what difference he or she will have in his ranks right so that's why I'll emphasize that whenever you come across any editorial either in express or lament or whatever means or the Hindu whatever news paper that you opt for right have absorbed so your approach toward this chapter should be that okay you are 
a new starter i do understand right so whenever you have these kind of terminologies right which cannot be understood in one go so you should prepare those kind of chapter or those kind of uh, topics right in layers so first have a broad idea about that particular topic build a structure that okay what are the things in the first go instead of uh, completing that particular so suppose a particular topic can be completed in 4 hours right so rather than investing 4 hours in one go right what you can do is that in the first go invest just 20 minutes in the first 20 minutes what you can do is that build a structure regarding that particular topic or that particular chapter build a skeleton that okay what is going to be the broad structure for that particular this particular chapter regarding uh, if i talk about this panchayati raj so what would be the if i have to divide this whole of the panchayati raj chapter so first i'll see the historical genesis a uh, genesis right so first is historical genesis then what was the this as part of this historical genesis you will see ancient then medieval approach then okay what happened in the british time what happened into this uh, uh, post independence india right so all those then 73rd and 70 into the second structure you will read second uh, this 73rd and 74th amendment right and in the final leg of that uh, preparation right what you will do is that you will analyze this particular 73rd so it has been around 27 years since 1993 so we will see whether what were the goal so goal was to politically empower the people at the grassroots level the goal was to bring democracy at the grassroots level right the goal was to decentralize the functions the goal was whatever parts the state does have to uh, decentralize some of the parts of the state to these panchayati raj so we'll in the third leg right what we can do is or in the third uh, leg of the preparation what we can do is that we can see the effectiveness of whatever means these panchayati raj institution or to what extent these panchayati raj institution and urban local bodies has been successful so in the first 20 minutes what i did is that i divided i created skeleton that okay first i'll dis uh, i'll get into this history right then i'll see that okay what was the provisions of this 73rd and 74th amendment and then i'll discuss or i'll read the effectiveness right so in the first 20 minutes you have a structure right now in mind right then you will invest another one hour or two hours into just reading the uh, what you call these three legs right what you can do is the next leg right that you will separate out so in the historical genesis you will read ancient then british approach then medieval approach then post independent mein jo committees wagere aai right so those we will discuss right then 73rd 74th mein kya hua then effectiveness in the third right another uh, what you call uh, two hours the four hour topic it was another two hour or another one hour 40 minutes that you do have is in the last leg that is the third leg what you can do is that you can mark those points that you feel is important for prelim exam right so you can just mark those factual points that okay it was 1993 okay it was 73rd 74th amendment what was the chronology of the committees right in what year these people these uh, committees were set up what was the basis of those committees thereafter uh, what are the compulsory provision that needs to be transferred from state to these pris what are not so compulsory provisions so those kind of factual things in the third layer or the third leg of the preparation you can do so this is the approach that you should take while preparing any kind of chapter or any kind of tough chapter right and the same approach you can take while preparation of these kind of vocabulary so your approach should be stock right whenever you have any kind of complex topic which you have never heard right so in the polity if i talk about i find that fundamental rights chapter is very difficult right means i not find means many of the aspirant or rather during my preparation as well i have found this part three of indian constitution very difficult right so go by article by article approach right divide into okay what is this right of equality how many article it does have so first i prepared the structure that okay right to equality right to religion right against exploitation all these things right to remedy right so okay five articles here three articles here four articles there thereafter i went into uh, articles separate articles so that should be your approach while preparing any kind of chapter so in this chapter if i talk about on the dictionary part right so your approach should be that okay stop right create that structure think about that thereafter start 
absorbing and then move instead of just okay this is a hindu article one by one one by one okay within 10 minutes my topic is over no you will have to understand you will have to understand you will have to analyze your own capacity right whether you are from saint stephen if you are from saint stephen then you can think of that okay i can complete any of the editorial in 4 minutes or 5 minutes because you already have that level of vocabulary you will not have to struggle on these kind of things but if you are coming from uh, uh, lower middle class families right if you have been from government school right so that thing you will have to compensate here right so that was the thing that i wanted to have declaration on so now let us enter into next slide and let us start discussing that why panchayati raj is necessary or why you want this urban local bodies or why do you want this gram sabhas why do you want this district uh, jila parishad and all those stuff right so if you remember this was the slide from if you are a regular viewer you would know that this is the slide from salient feature of indian constitution when we were discussing this salient feature of indian constitution on the basis of who governs we had divided political system across the globe into these kind of system so you had this when you are being ruled by none that system political system is called anarchy when you are ru being ruled by one person that is called autocracy then if you are being ruled by few then that is called oligarchy if you are being a political system or a nation is being ru ruled by all the people then that is called democracy while explaining the meaning of democracy and while explaining the types of democracy we had said that what kind of democracy that we are practicing is not direct democracy but the representative democracy we are do we do elect 700 or 800 odd people so at the parliamentary level you have this rajya sabha you have this lok sabha where we have elected or no slash nominated right 800 people and on the our behalf because it is not possible for 1.35 billion people to directly participate into the decision making to directly participate into the law making to directly participate into the policy making and that's why what we have opted is representative system we had also discussed that what are the difficulties with the direct democracy so you have these tools like ref referendum recall initiative so these kind of tool make so these uh, you have this uh, direct democracy being practiced in the switzerland but owing to the difficult tools right you cannot have referendum from 1.3 uh, 5 billion people you cannot keep recalling uh, your uh, mlas or member of parliament every second month right so he, there we had taken example that what are the difficulties with the initiative what is the difficulties with the recall in the diverse country like india or usa why we cannot have direct democracy in huge and diverse countries like india and uh, usa right so we had opted for representative democracy where you had that the union level you have this parliament and at the state level what we have is assemblies right so we do elect a member of parliament we do elect a member of legislative assembly and on our behalf right they people sitting in the assembly they people sitting in uh, the parliament they take all the decision but the thing is that it is not the true practice of democracy because the democracy the meaning of the true sense of democracy or true, true meaning of democracy that we have been studying from class 6 and the basic definition was by the people of the people for the people and this definition was from abraham lincoln right so that was actually the definition of direct democracy but we what we are following is representative democracy because of inherent disadvantages that this direct democracy brings itself right so we are practicing this representative democracy but direct democracy does have its advantage as well so okay the, this direct democracy does have some difficulties representative democracy we are practicing but it should not stop ourselves to move towards this direct democracy so our attempt as a democratic nation our attempt should be that we can we should go as closer to the direct democracy as possible right we should try to include people into the dcs direct decision making means everybody cannot participate in the decisions of the parliament into the decision but we can try to create some kind of structure at least from where their voices can also be heard so let us start working so yes direct democracy cannot have but what we can have is at least participative democracy where people can participate right so let us see what we have done to move towards this direct democracy and what we have so far done to be a participative democracy so with the operationalized 
organization of uh, this constitution we created two bodies there were two political entities at the national level you had this parliament and at the state level you had this assembly so first let us discuss about this parliament and thereafter we will move to the assembly so you have these 800 elected or nominated odd people sitting in the to the parliament into the lok sabha and rajya sabha and they are designing some scheme so let us see let us take example of one imaginary scheme so suppose a scheme is being designed for the creation of infrastructure for primary school primary school now this scheme is being designed for the nation whole of the nation means all of the state so what parliament can do is that okay primary uh, schools infrastructure is to be created so let us award 500 crore to each state or if it, it takes an equitable approach so what it can do is that okay let us not take an equal approach let us take an equitable approach and uh, it can categorize state into the larger state right and smaller state and when i am saying larger state or smaller state what i am uh, pointing out is that geographically larger so you have this up uh, you have this maharashtra you have rajasthan you have this madhya pradesh so these are andhra pradesh tamil nadu so these are larger state you have this kerala you have most of northeastern state you have telangana so these state will be fall, falling under these smaller states so what it can do is this scam a scheme can do is that okay 1000 crores to these larger state and 500 crores for the primary school uh, infrastructure creation for this smaller state now try to understand this kerala which already has this 90 percent more than 90 plus of uh, what you call literacy rate mizoram similarly right it does have high literacy rate uh, another northeastern state does have also high literacy rate what does it indicate that they do have strong primary uh, uh, school infrastructure and that's why they have been able to uh, bring these kind of good results or rather even if that is not an indicator the result is not indicator of the uh, having this strong primary school infrastructure suppose kerala says that hey central government right i do have this uh, many of the schools right i do have a lot of infrastructure but i want to use these 500 so i don't want to use this 500 crores for this primary uh, school creation primary health uh, infrastructure creation right what i want to i want to use for the capacity building of my teacher but this scheme will not allow it right because the scheme had been designed for the creation of primary health uh, primary school infrastructure creation and what ultimately kerala will end doing up is that it will create the schools it will create unnecessary structures which were not required of late in last one decade with the emergence of concept of collaborative federalism and cooperative federalism the nature of scheme that is being designed it has been changed and what we are doing is means parliament is doing it taking an area based approach where these kind of relaxation has been given but if you see the history of 60 or 65 years from 50s to 2004 or 2009 rather you will find similar kind of pattern right so parliament designs some scheme without understanding the requirement of a specific requirement of a particular state right it does so what my point is that this uniform approach in the scheme implementation or scheme design which has to be implemented across the nation does not work or is not effective right if a state is interested or if a state is saying that we do have enough of uh, that infrastructure or enough of the social structure right we are not interested in creation rather my our requirements are completely different please understand so as a center as a parliament what you should do while designing the scheme what you should be doing is that you should be defining broad objective of that scheme you define broad objective you define the outcome that you want to achieve so suppose regarding that uh, regarding this school infrastructure what was the purpose of school infrastructure creation so ultimate purpose was uh, your educational outcomes right so if you want to say that okay uh, the dropout rate has dropout rate of primary school student what is this dropout rate so dropout rate is nothing jab bache primary se secondary mein, primary se secondary mein move ho rahe hain senior se, uh, secondary se senior secondary mein move ho rahe hain right so unka movement agar yahan 98% hai to yahan bhi 98% hona chahiye ya fir kuch relaxation if you want to give so you can say that okay if 
a student has entered if 98% of the people a student of the age of 5 has entered into the primary school then at least uh, suppose 78% of the people or students should get into the secondary and if 78% of the student has entered into secondary then okay let us give some relaxation and let us say at least 68% of the students should get into senior secondary as well or another educational outcome you might say that okay there should be improvement in the results so suppose 10th class results has recently been announced by the CBSE. So, okay, last year what results that you achieved was 75%. Overall uh, performance of that school or at the 10th level was 75%. So, what our expectation this year would be that you achieve 78% of uh, overall results. So, you broadly define the educational outcomes or a outcome from that scheme and thereafter you leave it to the state right the fund that you are awarding or fund that you are giving 500 crores or 1000 crores you do not tie that fund to any kind of thing right you can tie that fund to these kind of objective rather than being very specific that you have to do this no you define these objective on the broader line be it any scheme, right? I am taking an educational example right now. It can be with, with many schemes, right? So, that was my point. And with this kind of understanding, right? With this kind of understanding that it can't be expected from the parliament because parliament ultimately in this kind of thing, uh, parliament cannot be said ki bhai unki hi sari ke sari galti hai. Because ultimately they have to take decision, they have to take a generalized approach, right? अगर कुछ स्टेट्स को छोड़ते हो तो दूसरे स्टेट्स को मतलब नुकसान होगा दूसरे स्टेट्स को नुकसान से आप बचाते हो तो कुछ और स्टेट्स को नुकसान होगा बिकॉज ऑफ डाइवर्स और ह्यूज ज्योग्राफी दैट वी हैव राइट सो व्हाट वी क्रिएटेड नेक्स्ट दिस वन साइज फिट अप्रोच यूनिफॉर्म अप्रोच इन पॉलिसी और लॉ मेकिंग स्पेशली इन द ह्यूज कंट्री लाइक इंडिया can be stifling 500 crore criterion for school infrastructure creation for all state. This example we already have taken. So, with that understanding that from parliament it cannot be expected to understand the true needs of the people, we uh, had another layer of, layer of government, right? So, what we have is at the state level, you have these assembly. So, people, MLAs sitting into the capitals, into the assembly, right? They are now taking the decisions instead of parliament, right? So, whatever function uh, that is needed to bring uniformity in country like currency, defense, foreign relation. So, those kind of function, if you remember, we have this something called schedule 7, right? So, in schedule 7, you have list 1, list 2 and list 3. So, in list 1, you have subjects that will be dealt by union, list 2 that will be dealt by state and list 3 you have this concurrent list. So, whatever subjects that is needed to bring uniformity across the nation that has been put up into the list 1, then state specific. So, you have this agriculture, you have this law and order, you have this health, right? Health rather in uh, or education, right? These are in concurrent list, right? So, whatever uh, uh, functions that can be fulfilled easily by the state that has been given to the states, the whatever function that is necessary to bring uniformity that has been awarded to the union, right? So, some function has been as per the schedules uh, 7, right? Some function has been given to the assembly as well, but the same reasoning that assembly as well cannot be because they also have to across this, uh, across in the uh, states what you do have is different kind of districts, right? So, again, uh, the requirement of different district can also be different, right? So, recently, if I take the example of Bihar, right? So, the north of, just a moment, if I take the example of Bihar, so Bihar, which is touching from Nepal, right? So, right now, from last four days, Bihar is completely into uh, this flood thing, right? So, northern Bihar's district, right, where this, you have this Gandak river, you have this uh, uh, rivers flowing from Nepal side, right? These rivers, almost every year, flood these northern districts of the Bihar. So, their requirement regarding the infrastructure, they do not need robust in kind of infrastructure. Their uh, uh, requirements regarding the rehabilitations are different from the requirement of the southern district and that is my point that whenever you are making any kind of uh, sitting into the capital or sitting into the assemblies, right? The policies or the designs that you are making, right, those policies need not to be again uniform. Although that will be uniform because you are making those policy for whole of the state, right, but you will have to have 
area based approach but how many schemes they will uh, design by following this area based approach that, that for a particular district have another scheme for that particular district have particular scheme right so my point is that again sitting into the capital again sitting into the assembly from these people as well you cannot expect that they will have real understanding exact understanding of the people of different district or people of different reasons or uh, different villages and that is why we created after much brohua right we created this in 1993 what we had is this PRIs what is this PRIs Panchayati Raj institution what are these ULB urban local bodies right so and with this creation of these PRIs if not completely to some extent we have become a participative democracy let us see how we have become with the with this creation of pris how we have become this participative democracy so these pris are nothing <coughs> sorry so these pris are nothing these are three tiered bodies right so at the top you have this uh, jilla parishad or you can say district councils or in, into hindi belts it is called Jilla Parishad. Then you have at the block level, you have these block samitis or you can say Panchayat Samiti. Panchayat Samiti. And at the bottom, what you do have is Gram Sabha. Right. So, this Gram Sabha. At the urban local level, you will have these wards and all. Right. So, who are the members of this Gram Sabha? So, the member of Gram Sabha will be all those who are eligible voters. So, every person who does hold voter card and is above 18 years will be part of this Gram Sabha. So, suppose 10 crores has been allocated or 1 crore has been allocated for a particular. What is the meaning of Gram? So, Gram will be village right so suppose one crore has been allocated for a particular village now it will be entirely incumbent on on this gram sabha they will sit all the people will sit all the voters eligible voters will sit if you remember that tree image that we had taken into uh, that background right so under the tree or uh, on the chopals right people will sit right they will ultimately decide that okay what is the requirement there whether they want to spend this one crore on the sanitation or uh, fishing or some kind of job creation or for uh, any kind of purpose or they want to invest in any kind of school building right so it will be entirely incumbent on this village and with this participation means ultimately these people are deciding into the Gram Sabha that what they are going to do with this allotted amount whatever it is whether it is 1 crore or 10 crore and that is why I am saying that okay we may not have become the direct democracy but at least with this uh, emergence of these PRIs and urban local bodies at the city level and the village level at least we have become at least right this participative democracy yes to what extent right uh, this PRIs has been effective whatever objective whether it it's objective was political empowerment whether it was objective was to bring governance closer to the people or administration closer to the people whether PRI is in last 27 years right has been effective to fulfill those objective right we'll have an analysis but yes we can say that with this creation of at least these structures right again I am pointing out that we can have the analysis that to what extent these uh, bodies right or 73rd stated objective into the 73rd or 74th amendment right what extent this stated objective has been effective right we will have a discussion into the third perhaps video right into this same chapter but yes means we can say that yes with this creation of these bodies we can at least claim that we are a participative democracy right so that was my point right so i hope that why aspect that why panchayati raj institution or why these urban local bodies would have been clarified now we are moving to the next slide to discuss this evolution of panchayati raj how it has evolved right so whether this panchayati raj traces its origin only to the british time during these mayos and ripples or it did have any ancient roots as well right so that we will discuss we will not discuss what was the situation of these panchayati raj or village council in medieval times although they existed into the medieval times by different name by different post right so you have these khuts and mukaddams right so those kind of thing but we will jump from directly from ancient time to the british time thereafter once british time is over 1947 is over right 
so you have this article 14 uh, sorry 40 right which talks about uh, these village council and uh, panchayat right so but that has been put up under the dpsp the stated goal right then we will move to the post independence india that what has been the situation of these panchayats right uh, after the post independence what has been the situation of various committees and commission what kind of commission and committees have set after 50s until 1993 right so those kind of discussion those balwant rai mehta committee ashok mehta committee then lm singhvi committee gvk rao committee so these kind of although there were tens of committees but we have picked up five or six important committees and their recommendation earlier i had thought of to let it off right just discuss the chronology with you guys and let this committee's recommendation off but since we are preparing for mains as well so it won't be proper for me to leave these kind of topics right so we'll study the recommendation of these committees as well right although most of the pre questions can be answered just by remembering the chronology of these committees so in lakshmikan you have three or four initial pages that has been dedicated to uh, these recommendation of these committees but from means believe me from means point if you read these recommendation it will be helpful to you in writing means answer right so after after that, we will get into this 1989 where you had this unsuccessful attempt by Rajiv Gandhi led government. So, your Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi, right, late Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi also had attempted uh, by 64th, 65th constitutional amendment bill in 1989, but that was an unsuccessful attempt. Finally, in 1993, led by this PVR, PV Narsimha Rao, that you had this 73rd and 74th constitutional amendment act by which this Panchayati Raj and urban local bodies had been created or had been given constitutional means it's not that from the 50s to 90 you did not have any panchayati institution you did not have existence of gram sabha you did not have so those structures existed but as far as uniformity in the structures across the nation and the constitutional status right it was entirely see uh, in the list five uh, in the, you have this list two list 2 which talks of in the into the schedule 7 right you have this list 2 which deals with states and into the states you have something called entries different entry so in entry 5 you have this panchayati raj right so it has been incumbent completely on the states right that what kind of structures whether they want two tiered structure of these panchayati raj one tiered structure or four tiered structure so it was so there was no uniformity across the nation in different states you have different kind of structure different kind of function so these people or these institution or these bodies were functioning completely on to the mercies of state but finally in 1993 what you had is that the constitutional status was awarded to these uh, bodies right so i hope at least evolution of panchayat you will have although we'll have a discussion on these things these bodies separately so let us see what was the status of these panchayati raj during the ancient time so if you have read this ancient india properly so you would be aware about these kind of dictionary so you have this gramini award that has been used uh, in context of village headman right so into the vedic times as well you had this mention of gramini then you have this ganas and sanghas into the post vedic period right post vedic period and then you have uh, strengthened very strengthened rural and urban administration during Maurya's times as well we, where you will find words like dictionaries like gramin and gopas what is the meaning i am not going to explain i expect that in ancient india you already would have covered then you at the rashtrakuta if you go into the maharashtra section you had this rashtrakuta dynasty and where you had this vishaya and bukti what is this bukti so bukti was being referred to the village right vishaya is nothing it is modern day equivalent of district right so whole of the Rashtrakuta empire had been divide, divided into multiple vishayas and these vishayas had been uh, divided into various buktis right so bukti district and then first you had this whole of empire empire had been divided into multiple districts and uh, every district had been divided into multiple buktis right so these buktis are nothing this is village administration and when something is talking about village administration it is nothing it is referring to these pris panchayati raj institution similarly you had this chola empire and chola empire rather is known for its village administration panchayati raj institution rather they had very extensive qualification and disqualification parameters for a member to be elected into urs or sabha or nagaram right so chola administration was very much famous for and if you have not covered 
uh, this ancient India on these lines, I request you that go into these part because it is in from these kind of sections. Uh, see, in ancient India, when you are covering right, in, in from ancient India, it is vocabulary that becomes very important because uh, that is not usually means. In the polity, you keep uh, hearing about rights of MP, qualification, some MLA has been disqualified. So, recently in Rajasthan, 19 MLA has been served, anti-defection notice that, okay, tell us that why you should not be disqualified for violation of whip that had been issued by the Congress legislator CLP, Congress legislator parties, right. So, recently there were two calls, right, two days meeting of this Congress legislature party uh, by led by their chief minister and these 90 MLAs including Sachin Pilot had not appeared into those meetings. So, whip CP Joshi has issued this whip notice, right. So, these kind of vocabulary you keep hearing as far as polity or modern history as well, right. So, those vocabulary you will have, but vocabulary that has been used into the art and culture, vocabulary that has been used into ancient India, right, you do not get those kind of vocabulary into the daily life, be it about the coin, be it about administration, be it about these kind of uh, institution, right. So, those vocabulary you will have to have expertise on. So, by this you can understand that there was existence of Panchayati Raj or similar kind of institution. Uh, we do not know that what they were being referred, these kind of institutions were being referred. Uh, in Chola administration, you can call it Ura and Sabha, right. Into uh, this Vedic period, right, you have this village headman, Gramini, then Gana and Sangha. Uh, in Vedic period, you have this Mahabharata and in Mahabharata, you have some a book called Shanti Parva. In Shanti Parva, these words like uh, Gana and Sangha has been mentioned. So, from these kind of vocabulary, you can deduce that yes, during ancient time as well, there was existence of these kind of institution. Let us move to uh, discuss uh, what was the situation of PRI's uh, Panchayati Raj institution during uh, this uh, British time, right. So, you have this uh, 1870 where Mayo brings a resolution for these. Uh, decentralization and this Mayo resolution of decentralization is considered as emergence for these PRIs. Finally, in 1882, you have this Ripon's framework and by this Ripon's framework, your PRIs, Panchayati Raj institution becomes very famous and to famous to the extent that this Ripon will be called father of local self-government in India, father of local Ripon, right. So, this name from the modern history point as well you need to remember, right. Then finally, in 1919, you had this Montagu Chemsford reform go or alternatively it is also called Government of India Act 1919, where Panchayat was transferred. So, if you remember, by 1919 you had uh, government at the center and government in the provinces as well, but in provinces you have this concept of transferred subject and reserved subject. So, Panchayati Raj institution into the 1919 had been moved into the transferred subject means it is being monitored, these kind of subjects will be monitored by governor, but in consultation with elected council of minister. What was this reserve subject? So, these reserve subject were reserved for the governor and the governor will take this decision uh, in discretion without consulting Council of Ministers. So, from Government of India Act 1919, this uh, Panchayat had been moved into this transferred section. Finally, in, until 1925, you will see that most of the provinces, be like Odisha or Bihar, right, all those state, states had passed their Panchayati Raj Act. There may be some difference with the structures, but as far as by 95, almost every uh, province had some kind of structure, some kind of Panchayati Raj. Uh, structures they had, right. So, by 1925, you had almost every state, states like Bihar, Odisha, right. So, almost every state had uh, in one form or other, right, they had their own version of Panchayati Raj Act and they had some kind of structure, the kind of structure that we do have today, right. So, you have this three-layered structure by after 90, uh, 93-73rd Amendment Act, right. So, those kind of structure they may not have that, uh, but in one form or another, almost every state or every province did have these kind of Panchayati Raj institutions. So, I hope the ancient aspect or the British aspect of Panchayati Raj would be clear to you. Let us move to the next slide and let us discuss those committees. So, what was the status of these Panchayat into the ancient time would be clear. British time we have discussed. Now, we are directly jumping to post what was the situation of these uh, what you call uh, institution or Panchayati Raj post 
uh, independence. So see, your constitution had been operationalized in 1950, right? And in 1950, by 1950, you had this, you have this article called Article 40, right? That deals with suggestion of this Panchayati Raj institution, right? So in constitution that has been put up in DPSP, you have Panchayati Raj, mention of Panchayati Raj or this village Panchayat, right? Thereafter means all the state, means every state did have some kind of again structure, but thereafter it started from 1952, you had this starting of community development program. Then after community development program, you had this national extension services, right? So, next national extension scheme that was started and thereafter in 1957, right? You had the establishment of first committee and that was Balwant Rai Mehta committee to oversee the effectiveness of community development program that was being run by this center. And what was this community development program? So, in community development program, you had this cluster of suppose 50 to 100 villages that were being put together and you had this design of scheme, right? Or people of these 50 or 70 states, right? At the district level, not all the people would directly participate, but their district administration would sit together, right? And they'll take decision that what is good or what is the kind of thing that is necessary for these 50 or 70, right? Uh, villages, right? So, that was about the community development program there. After in community development program, you had this national extension services where subjects like irrigation, subjects like agriculture was added, right? So, this Balwantra and Mehta committee in 1950, which was established in 1957, right? Their term of reference, the term of reference of this Balwantra and Mehta committee was to oversee that how these community development program or national extension services has functioned in last five or seven years. And if there is any major or any suggestion that has to be taken, right? So, those suggestion has to be given by this. So, that was the term of reference of this Balwant Rai Mehta committee in 1957, right? So, now we are entering into this committee section. And as I already have told you that there are tens of committee. Uh, including the six committee or five committee that we are going to discuss, right? So, there were tens of committee that were established by various government and various parties. So, mind you, uh, there have been committees that has been established by the uh, what you call government as well and there has been occasion where committee has been established by Congress party as well, right? Uh, rather, Janta party had also established in 97, we will discuss that, right? So, that was the thing. Now, coming back to this lecture. So, what we have done is that out of those tens of committee, we have taken just five or six committee and that we will have a discussion on. So, we will start our discussion from Balwantrai Mehta committee which was established in 1957. The term of reference of this Balwantrai Mehta committee that okay, what was the thing that they were to oversee would be clear because that we already have discussed. Then Ashok Mehta committee in 1977. Then you have this GVK Rao committee, then LM Singhvi committee and then finally in 1988 you have this Gadgil committee. There are other committees. K. Hanumantarao committee, then you have this uh, Thangan committee. So, those committee we are because these are the committees which are more important, right? So, their discussion or their recommendation will in what context they appeared or they were established and uh, what were their recommendations. So, that we are going to discuss. So, this is your Balwant Rai Mehta committee. So, this Balwant Rai Mehta committee, their first recommendation was uh, creation of this three tiered or three layered. Uh, structure, physical structure, right? So, at the top you had this Jila Parishad, then in at the intermediate level it was supposed to have this Panchayat Samiti and at the bottom level you have this Gram Sabha. So, until now, again let me declare that it is not that until 1957 or until this recommendation of Balwant Rai Mehta Committee, there was no existence of Panchayati Raj institution. What was lacking was this uniformity in structure, right? So, some state does have only or uh, did have only uh, one structure, some state had this two layered structure, few state may have four layered structure as well. So, there was no uniformity across state. So, the first thing or first recommendation that Balwant Rai talked about there or his recommendation was to bring uniformity across uh, these states, right? So, that was the first recommendation. 
now what will be the composition how the composition of members will be so it said that the gram sabha right at the gram sabha level whatever members of this gram sabha see as far as this gram sabha is concerned all the people all the eligible voters will be member or they'll be participating into what you call when a broad decision has to be taken but ultimately uh, this gram sabha will also be divided into various ward right and there would be something called ward member or uh, this definition or this vocabulary for this ward member can vary from state to state right so there would be like some elected members who will be representing gram sabha at the level of panchayat samiti right so it said that at the gram sabha level all the persons so suppose you decided to have suppose 15 member council at the gram sabha level right so at the gram sabha level people will be directly elected all the peoples will be directly elected while at the panchayat samiti or jilla parishad or at the district level you will have these indirectly Elected. So that was about election or nomination or the composition that he talked about. So that was his second recommendation. If I talk about the roles, so about roles it said that primarily this Gram Sabha and Panchayat both including these both the bodies right they will have a executive role. So there will be scheme, scheme that has been prepared either by state or union when the scheme reaches to this uh, panchayat samiti level or gram sabha level right it is these people this panchayat samiti or gram sabha who will be implementing so until now what you have is you have various kind of institution at the district level so in the health sector you have something called nrhm right national rural health mission at the in the irrigation at the district level again you will have some department uh, for the to address the issues of children below six year you have since 96 1975 you have this icds that is being run so all the scheme you have this in the uh, education you have at the district level somebody running this at the BU block level rather BO block education officer that is running that is responsible for operationalization or running of this or implementation of this Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan right. So there are various bodies right different bodies that is working so in health sector there is a separate body in education sector there is a separate body into this malnutrition or uh, child health care right there is a separate body right that is working in the implementation of these various kind of schemes. So what his recommendation was that all these execution of various schemes should be done by not by these bodies, these separate bodies because if these separate bodies are ultimately doing the implementation do job right there will be issue of coordination. So all these implementation or all the execution of different scheme should be done by these Gram Sabha or Panchayat Samiti right while the role of Jila Parishad will be of advisory or supervisory. I hope that point also you will have clarity on. Now, if I talk about next point, so the next point it said was that there should be gradually and this point should not be overnight, right? This kind of changes you cannot expect overnight. So, on this point it said, see, uh, right now what you have is Schedule 7. I keep referring to the schedule 7 every time so you have this list 1 list 2 so out of this list what is this list 2 so in list 2 you have this legislative subject on which state can legislate right so you have this agriculture you have this law and order right so here principle of subsidiarity should be followed principle of subsidiarity so all those from what is the meaning of principle of subsidiarity so the meaning of principle of subsidiarity is that all those function which can best performed by these organization or these tiers those should be transferred from list to that is state list to these institutions so that is the meaning of principle of subsidiarity if i take overall meaning of principle of subsidiarity if i talk about this overall meaning of this principle of subsidiarity so the overall meaning of this principle of subsidiarity is that the a function that can be best performed by a particular political entity so for example functions like foreign relation functions like defense functions like this currency so in these kind of issues what you need is or functions like international relation so these kind of things 
can be best performed because here you require uniformity. So these kind of functions should be performed by or should be assigned to union. But subjects like agriculture, subjects like education can be given to the state. So similarly, whatever subjects or whatever functions that can be best performed by these panchayats, right? So that should be transferred from list to to these. Uh, these kind of organizations. So, that is what it is talking about and again this uh, did not talk about this overnight transfer of these kind of thing, right. Uh, he also knew that this is going to be a gradual process. So, gradually there should be genuine transfer of funds, functionaries and finances, right. So, these are the things that he talked about. So, these were primarily his recommendation, right. So, this was about this Balwantrai Mehta committee that was established in 1957, how effective it was that has been put up means uh, to what extent his recommendations were considered that has been put up onto this slide, right. This is a simple thing that you can read. So, when you will get PDF, you can simply read. Let me read it. So, uh, Rajasthan was the only, not only state, sorry, Rajasthan, uh, Rajasthan, Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. So, these were three states and there were one or two more states. So, there were four or five states which actually implemented this three tier structure. Although about this particular suggestion that there should be genuine transfer of funds, there should be genuine transfer finances, even to uh, even today this kind of debate is ongoing. So, on this recommendation we will not talk about because this debate is still ongoing. There has no means it has been around 27 years since uh, operationalization of 73rd and 74th amendment and there has not been uh, actual transfer of uh, funds. There has been means occasionally states keep transferring funds and functionary, but if I talk about empowerment or capacity building or real transfer of fund or real transfer of functionaries, right, that is yet uh, something uh, that is to be fulfilled, right. So, this we are not talking about, but yes, states like Andhra Pradesh, states like Rajasthan, Rajasthan rather was the first state in 1957, which uh, implemented at least this recommendation, creation of this three tiered structure, right. So, Rajasthan, Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu were uh, four or five few states which uh, did create this kind of no effective transfer of function, functionaries and finances, body largely remained physical structures rather than being organic structures, right. So, I hope the recommendation of Balwant Rai Mehta committee would be clear to you. Now, we are delving into Ashok Mehta committee. So, Ashok Mehta committee 1977, Janta government you had in 1977. So, in 1977 you had in Janta government that uh, established this uh, Ashok Mehta committee and the recommendation of Ashok Mehta committee. So, here uh, in the previous slide if you remember, right, Balwant Rai Mehta committee had recommended for the creation of three layered structure, but Ashok Mehta is recommending that there should be two layered structure and that two layered structure is this Jila Parishad and Mandal Panchayat. So, it is not recommending uh, what you call this uh, uh, Gram Sabha, right. Instead of instead uh, regarding this Gram Sabha, it is saying that there should be rather Mandal Panchayat instead of having multiple Gram Sabha below this Gram Sabha GS. GS, right. So, instead of having multiple uh, this Gram Sabha, right, there should be Mandal Panchayat, right, and the size of Mandal Panchayat can be from uh, 15,000 to 20,000, right. So, every 20,000 of population you can have one Mandal Panchayat and over this Mandal Panchayat you will have this Jila Parishad. But there are few new things that this Ashok Mehta committee is going to talk about, right, and those are few notable points. A notable point is regarding this creation of, so for, for the first time any committee is going to talk about creation of state election committee, commission. So, you have this ECI election commission of India and election commission of India if you know is responsible for election of or to oversee the election of president, vice president, Rajya Sabha, Lok Sabha, legislative assembly and legislative council. So, all these elections are overseen by election commission of India. As far as this municipal and uh, PRIs, Panchayati Raj bodies election are concerned, right now currently it is being observed by state election commission and this state election commission is a constitutional body and it had been created by 73rd amendment itself, right. So, there is a mention, but for the first time, for the, uh, there is being appeal that is being made by state, uh, that is being made by Ashok Mehta uh, committee, right, for this creation of state election commission. So, that is the first notable point. The second notable point that it is going to talk about reservation. So, reservation for home, SCs, 
STs and women. So how visionary means these kind of recommendation we are going to implement in 1993 but that is being recommended here in 1977 itself that there should be reservation. So these are a uh, few and taxation power as well right it is talking about that there should be wide taxation power that should be so that uh, fund ke mobilization mein inko dikkat na ho. there should be no issues in the fund mobilization of uh, these institutions. So, these are few notable points regarding creation of state election commission regarding this reservation right. So, let us discuss these one by one. So, regarding this Mandal Panchayat it sought about two functions, two roles and the two roles was that okay it will look into the development functions as well right. So, while uh, scheme implementation right it will look into this development function and then it will have some judicial functions as well. And as part of judicial functions, right, it talked about creation of this Nyaya Panchayat under every Mandal Panchayat, right. So, judicial function and developmental function. I hope you will have clarity on this role of this Mandal Panchayat. About this role of uh, Jila Parishad, it talked about. So, it said that Jila Parishad job would be planning and execution, right. So, whatever requirements or whatever uh, needs of these Mandal Panchayat, these Mandal Panchayat will forward their requirements or their needs or uh, requirement about funds or uh, any services or any facility that they need, right. Right. Finally, uh, there will be n number of Mandal Panchayats, right? Jila Parishad will collate all the reports from various Mandal Panchayats and thereafter it will plan that okay, uh, depending on, again depending on uh, the resources, right? It will plan ki bhai, uh, kya kya hona chahiye, kiski kiski demand maani jani chahiye. So, it will be responsible for planning as well and finally execution as well it will be responsible Jila Parishad. If you if remember you into this Balwant Rai committee right for the execution it was not the Jila Parishad. Jila Parishad had this supervisory role, advisory role. Execution had been given to the intermediate level Panchayat Samiti and the Gram Sabha while execution here is being directly done by Jila Parishad right. So, that was uh, that is the one difference. Another thing if you see right. So, they must be given power to taxation. I already told you that it talked about power of taxation or taxation ki agar power de rahe ho to accountability measure also you will have to ensure something right. So, there should be any organization right. If they have if they are getting funds by way of taxation right. So, who is going to see that whether these taxes or these funds are being utilized in an effective manner or not. So, there should be some social audit agencies that it talked about, it recommended this Ashok Mehta committee to ensure accountability. Then it is going to talk about reservation already told you right for SC and ST community okay. Then a uh, state election commission should conduct. So, creation of this state election commission for the first time by any committee is being talked about should conduct the election for those two layers in consultation with the ECI right. So, this is going to be a nascent body for the first time it is being created. So, to some for five years or for seven years they would require uh, into the administration or how this voting or how this uh, process work of voting process work right. So, they will need the help of uh, the state election commission will need help of election commission of India right. So, I hope those points would be clear to you. Then it talked about that okay participation of political parties as well it is going to allow right. Although again states are not going to many states are not going to be very enthused by this suggestion elected bodies should not be dissolved normally once elected it will remain for 5 years right. Uh, 5 years unless there is any compelling circumstances and if state is dissolving any uh, elected uh, council, any elected Mandal Panchayat or Jila Parishad, then it must conduct new election or fresh election within 6 months. So, these were all the recommendations of the Ashok Mehta committee that was established by the Janta government in 1977. So, I hope Ashok regarding this Ashok Mehta committee you will have clarity on right. If I talk about this GVK Rao committee, right. So, GVK Rao committee had been established by 90 uh, in 1985, right, and only notable recommendation was of a for a separate district development officer. So, you had this IAS officer who used to head uh, what you call who used to be district magistrate as well and would uh, chair this Jila Parishad as well, right. Jilla Parishad as well. So, what it told is that instead of see 
as far as this DM is concerned, you need to have a separate DM. But as far as uh, this district development officer is concerned, have another IAS right into the district who will have this developmental role because from a DM right, uh, if you know uh, a DM does have many responsibility. Uh, at one particular time is district is of uh, uh, Rajasthan or UP like larger state or Maharashtra right at one time any DM does remain or does chair around 140 he will be head of 140 or 150 committee so it is not humanly possible that he will can oversee this function in a effective manner as well and that's why there was appeal ki bhai ek separate ek IAS officer rakho who will see into the development functions itself so that was only notable feature about uh, that was only notable recommendation of this gv kerao committee right i hope you will have clarity on this now we are entering into this LM Singhvi committee that was established in 1986 by Rajiv Gandhi government and all these committee that we discussed that is being established by the Rajiv Gandhi government. Next Gadgil committee that we will see that will be set up not by the government but that will be set up by Congress party. So that thing you will have to remember. Now what is the recommendation? So one notable recommendation. So the notable recommendation of Ashok Mehta committee state election commission and it talked about reservation for the SCs and ST right. So similarly the notable feature see the general thing will remain uh, same across these recommendation but the notable feature that you need to remember right. So the notable feature of Balwant Rai three tier committee and then it talked about uh, gradual transfer of the function. The notable feature of Ashok Mehta committees that was creation of state election commis commission, then involvement of the political parties right and then uh, you had this uh, attestation power right. So all those things and then reservation for SCs and ST. Now the notable feature of for this LM Singh B committee is going to be that it will talk for the first time any committee is going to uh, talk about conferment of constitutional status right constitutional protection should be provided to panchayati raj institutions so that they could have separate identity which will be inviolable right state at its will state at its whims or council of minister at his or her whims or fancy should not dissolve it right it should have a constitutional identity so that is one new uh, notable feature as far as free and fair regular election right so that is common between this ashok mehta committee because ashok mehta committee was also talking about this creation of state election commission and then if it is being dissolved due to any compelling circumstances then uh, within six months there should be election right so this is a common point that free fair election should be next point that is notable that it is talking about that there should be a judicial tribunal right so if there is any controversy surrounding election of a member right who will adjudicate right so there should be a separate body instead of this high going to the subordinate court or high court right or election commission or state election commission right there should be a separate judicial tribunal right which will adjudicate on the issues of election right so that is a second notable point the Nyaya Panchayat Nyaya Panchayat had already been talked in this Ashok Mehta committee so that is not new should be established for the cluster of villages then Gram Sabha's role into the development should be emphasized so that is one uh, that is uh, these are the points that has been recommendation of LM Singhvi committee right so constitutional this is the one point constitutional status then judicial tribunal second notable point and Nyaya Panchayat that is old right so this was all about this LM Singhvi committee now this is the last committee's recommendation that we are going to discuss so you 1988 itself you had the establishment of uh, VN Gadgil committee right and that had been appointed by the Congress so a party right so what are the recommendations so constitutional protection it also talks about here it talks about three tier system so that had already been talked in Balwantrai Mehta committee then fixed term and provision for uh, Panchayati Raj for of Panchayati Raj institution right so that is one incompleteness then reservation of SC, ST and women it is talking about so that is one addition women Ashok Mehta committee did not talk about 
Ashok Mehta committee, right? So, women also it is talking about. Ashok Mehta committee had talked about this SC and reservation for SCs and ST. Then, establishment of state finance commission. So, that is one new point establishment of state finance commission. State election commission had already been talked about. Then, this tax collecting power that has been common thread across the recommendation of various committees. So, these are the committees that I had put up there. Besides that, there is Hanumantharao committee, then Thakshan committee, right. So, those committee recommendations, those are not very important and that is why I have not put up. So, so after this Gadigal committee in 1988, in 1989 you had this Rajiv Gandhi government which made its first uh, unsuccessful attempt behind for the creation of uh, this PRI, Panchayati Raj Institution in 1989 by 64th and 64th fifth constitutional amendment bill and why did this uh, he fail in his attempt because the kind of provision for the PRIs that had been put up in this constitutional amendment bill those were very ambitious and uh, to some extent the involvement of center and involvement the role that has been created in these PRIs for the see all the provision we are not going to discuss right because those are not impo very important right why did it fail or why it could not pass this Rajya Sabha right so all the those provisions are not important but let me tell you that why did it fail why it could not made through the Rajya Sabha. So, the apprehension of various regional parties or state parties was that the kind of role that had been created in these PRIs for the district magistrate or IAS officer at the Jila Parishad level, those were very ambitious. They had been given very ambitious role. They had a very extensive powers and uh, in those times during Indra Gandhi's time and Rajiv Gandhi's time, right, this IAS officer used to along with governor, Raj, uh, this IAS officer also used to work as an agent of center. So, so these, these regional parties which were still in kind of infancy stage, right, they were still in nascent stage, right. So, they were feeling threatened that uh, this will have a primary role using this muscle power right using uh, the financial power because center is going to fund this panchayati raj institution primarily right state were also expected to contribute but primarily center was going to fund so using the financial power or is using this financial cloud right center plus dm right so the combined power of center financial uh, power of the center and this role of dm right so congress is going to invent uh, role for itself, right? Congress will have dominance, right? They will have a good image in the state that Congress is all, uh, all the things are being done by the Congress, right? So, the their existence, regional parties existence was ultimately threatened. They feel, felt threatened and the result was that in Lok Sabha, Rajiv Gandhi led government had huge majority. So, it crossed the Lok Sabha stage, but collective might of Raj, uh, opposition party in the Rajya Sabha, right, this bill could not face and this bill faltered in 1989, right. So, that was about the 64th and 65th amendment. Finally, in 1992, you had this PV Narsimha Rao government which brought this 73rd and 74th constitutional amendment and that was passed ultimately in 1993, right. So, 73rd uh, constitutional Amendment uh, Act that deals with Panchayati Raj Institution, 74th Constitutional Amendment Bill that is going to deal with uh, urban local ULBs that we keep referring as, right, so urban local bodies. This is going to insert new part that is part 9 in Indian Constitution. The related articles are Article 243 A2O, right. So, all the, all the functions, all the composition, roles, right, that will be covered uh, means whole of the part 9, right, that has been covered in Article 243 itself, right. So, as I already had told you that there is something called part 9, then part 9A and there is part 9B. This will deal with Panchayati Raj, this will deal with these urban local bodies and this 9B will deal with cooperative societies, right. So, Article 243A to O, let me clear it. So, Article 243A to O is going to deal with Panchayati Raj institutions. P, after O, you have this P, right? Same article, Article 243, P to Z, Z. So, P to Z and after Z, right? There will be Z A, Z B, Z C, right? So, until Z G, you will have these urban local bodies and after Z G, Article 243, Z G, right, you will have this cooperative society. So, articles related to uh, this cooperative society, if you know, right, that had been created by 97th amendment, constitutional amendment, right. So, another thing besides adding this part and these articles to the constitution, another thing that is 73rd and 74th constitutional amendment day was that 
two schedules were added. So initially in the constitution you had these eight schedules, right? With gradually uh, you had this introduction of ninth schedule in 1951 itself. Thereafter you had this introduction of tenth schedule, right? In 1975. right this tenth schedule matter or subject will be changed ultimately in 1986 and 11th and 12th schedule was added by 73rd and 74th amendment so 74th amendment dealt with uh, sorry inserted is schedule 11 and 74th schedule 12 right so this schedule 11 is nothing it consists of 29 functions that is supposed to be that is supposed to be transferred from state to these panchayati raj institutions simply schedule 12 as well contains some functions that is again supposed to be transferred from states to these urban local bodies so this was all about means uh, this was uh, starting ancient india what has been the position of uh, these panchayati raj institution right until the 73rd and 74th amendment so with this we are wrapping up this lecture today right we three mcq so this is the first mcq that i expect you to attempt second mcqs and third mcq so this lecture will cover will split this lecture into three videos first video this is right second and third video you'll have to wait for so till then bye bye